So I just published an interview I did with Nicholas Colas, a 30-year Wall Street financial expert, but who uniquely also has experience in the auto industry. Nick dropped a number of amazing predictions. First, he believes that automakers in China may not be able to go global. He believes that other than Tesla, shockingly, of the legacy automakers, it's Toyota who will be able to survive. And why it's critical Tesla becomes a low-cost provider of vehicles. So let's watch some of those clips. We'll have uh, Jeff Lutz join us. So Nick is not only led the equity deal that saved Chrysler 91, but he also led the first auto company in China to go IPO. I think he's like one of the most a few that has real credibility. And so it behooves us Tesla investors to listen to him. Uh, quick comments, Jeff. No, I, I think the video is great. There's a lot of important takeaways that we should dissect. And I'd love to have a kind of a supply chain overlay on some of the comments as well. Exactly. That's why I wanted you to be on right now, because we're going to talk about low cost provider. Tesla needs to be the low cost provider, which is fantastic to hear from an auto expert. You know, uh, folks, the reason why you should listen to Jeff is because he himself is an ex-supply chain executive. He's worked at a number of Fortune 100 companies, and he now runs his own consulting firm. Let's watch this clip of Nick Colas talking about uh, Tesla becoming a low, needing to be a low-cost provider. The most important thing to understand about the global auto industry is there's 40% more capacity than there is demand. So mm. it varies by product line, but this is a tremendously overcapacitized industry for a whole variety of reasons. But basically, capacity doesn't leave the system when companies lose market share. Um, car companies are very important employers in a lot of countries, and a lot of countries don't want to see car companies and shut down plants. And so they give them incentives. They give them, they give them different financial incentives and other social incentives to keep plants open. You know, so for example, GM went bankrupt during the financial crisis and the U.S. government basically bailed them out and helped them out of bankruptcy. Um, that capacity could have left the system, but it didn't. And so we still have more capacity for car production globally than we have demand. That creates a very unhealthy dynamic because you have basically too much supply chasing too too little demand for the capacity that's installed. And that's why the industry has very low returns on capital. So as a result, it's very hard to make a good margin over time in the car industry because it basically you're competing with way too much capacity. The other issue, and this is particularly topical for electric vehicles, um, and just to give you a little bit of background, there are obviously, as your as your audience knows, mandates for how what percentage of electric vehicles each car company will sell in five or ten years' time in the U.S. and Europe. And there are some mandates in China right now that will no doubt grow. It's a big part of the EV bull story. We've tried this before in the U.S. <clears throat> with something called corporate average fuel economy or CAFE. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what CAFE started to do in the 1970s was mandate how many, what, what average miles per gallon a vehicle fleet had to be. So if a car company wanted to sell cars in the U.S., their corporate average fuel economy had to be, call it, 15 miles per gallon. And it's gone up to 40 and 50 now. That dynamic was supposed to encourage the, the sale of small, efficient vehicles. The trouble is gas prices are very low in the U.S. relative to the rest of the world. And so you ended up with a situation where small cars, it became very unprofitable and only the most efficient car companies like Toyota were able to sell small cars at a profit. The domestic car companies slowly receded out of that business to the point where it's almost impossible to buy a passenger car from a U.S. automaker anymore. They just don't make them anymore because they got competed away and out of that business. There's a lesson here for the EV industry, and, and Elon Musk understands this crystal clear. You have to be the low-cost producer in a market where your product is being mandated because consumers have to be attracted to the product enough to buy it versus an alternative. And for the next many years, they will have alternatives. They will be able to buy an ICE vehicle. So if you are a car company selling EVs, you have to be the low-cost producer, and you have to keep cutting price. The two things go hand in hand because you have to pull consumers into your showroom and have them sign for a car. And that takes price and, and nothing else really will do. So as much as there have been price cuts in EVs, there probably will be more. And it's why it's so critical that, you know, Musk and Tesla are very clearly focused on being the low cost producer, because that's the way you survive is being the low cost producer. And the cafe example shows you that if you don't do that, GM, Ford, the old Chrysler, now Stellantis, if you don't do that, if you're not the low cost producer, you will not be able to compete in that marketplace at all. And that's the death knell for those companies if they can't.
No, Jeff, you are a very experienced in market dynamics. Curious uh, what you're thinking about Tesla becoming, yeah, but, needing to become the low cost producer. Yeah, there are three things, um, big, big chunks of that video. One was around capacity of the auto industry and the implications on price or cost. The second thing was vehicle size and cafe standards. And the third one was the kind of wrapping it all together and being the, the low cost provider. So Quickly on capacity, I've, I've talked about this on your show, Herbert, and Cyber Bowls as well. The, the U.S. auto industry at one point was producing, I believe, 21 million units in a year, if you looked at the SAR from one of the prior years uh, since 2000. So at some point, the auto industry um, installed capacity for that, and that was really before Tesla was at, you know, it's running at its couple million unit run rate and, you know, six to 700K in the U.S. So, you know, there was about a million EVs in that. So just... The, the, the U.S. auto industry had, had already built up to over 21 million units. And then suppliers in that industry are contractually obligated to keep anywhere from, you know, 10 to, you know, 25, 30 percent more capacity in their in their contracts for burst capacity. So you can just add that on top of the 20, 21 million units. And you can see why Nick said, you know, the, the U.S. auto industry, I think it's 30, you know, maybe 30 to 40 percent. Nick said 40 percent over capacity. So what happens is that that doesn't go away. Somebody paid for that capacity, labor was hired, facilities were built, and then now you have those costs. At some point, you know, th those get deprecated, but you know, we don't know when and and, and who's carrying those costs, uh, especially when it spans across the entire business. So takeaway one is the the US auto industry is over capacity and don't get fooled by you know, the, the U.S. SAR going up 10% year over year. Last year was supposedly supply constrained year. So we're only up at like 15 and a half million units and this U.S. auto industry had shipped, you know, around 21 million. So there's the excess capacity that just weighs on cost. The second thing was around vehicle size. So if you're, if you're building smaller vehicles to meet these, these mileage standards, you still have, and you, and you haven't reduced the complexity and the part count and really purposefully simplified the manufacturing operations to make the smaller vehicle like Tesla's in this multi-year effort trying to build this 25 sub $25,000 vehicle. If you leave the same complexity, but just build a smaller device, you're still doing a similar num a similar number of operations, but you're, you're, you're caught in, which leaves your cost structure to be very high. The process times are still very high. But the amount of like raw material and mass and what people are buying, they don't value the smaller vehicles like they would the larger vehicles. And therefore, you can't sell them, you know, at a premium. Same thing goes on in, in many consumer electronics industries as well. So smaller, the smaller vehicles basically are, are garnering less margin in general. And that's another problem for the U.S. In, in, in Europe, uh, it's even a bigger issue because the cost of fuel is a lot higher and they're forced to make a lot of smaller vehicles for that market. And also the regulatory climate is even more strict than the U S so watch out for these cafe standards. I know a lot of the, the big three are really pushing back on the current administration regarding these standards and cause it's driving them to build smaller vehicles, but their profit pool is, you know, in the, in the pickup truck segment, the larger SUV segment, and that's what's causing um, consternation. And then finally, just wrapping all this together is figuring out how to be the low cost leader, how to build your supply chain like Tesla has with fewer, later, fewer layers, greater amounts of vertical integration. And therefore, when you have these shocks of the SAR going from 21 million to 15 million to 17 million, you're not, your supply base isn't feeling as much of those shocks and you aren't feeling as much of those shocks. So having a very efficient supply chain and having a very efficiently designed vehicle you know, and, and, and really just gunning for lower and lower costs, really like there's no point, there's no point in stopping, you know, there's still six years into, in the shipping, the model three, and they were still doing part changes on the old version this year. And then now they've designed a completely, you know, updated version that they've been able to simplify the cost, cost structure further and charge more since they're giving more features. So the being low cost leader is, is critical to, to survival in in the uh, in the auto market
you know, you've been saying this for so long, uh, especially accelerated since January with the price cuts. You've been explaining and sharing with us, teaching us how the world works and factories and supply chain and price cuts and prices. <laughs> Finally, we have somebody else in the auto industry kind of repeat what you've been saying. So that's great. Hopefully more of the Tesla, you know, investor audience that we speak to, they'll understand why it's so critical for them to cut prices. <clears throat> now, next topic here is that <laughs> Nick Cola says that we should actually raise cash, not forget the buybacks, but actually raise cash and how critical it is. Let's watch this clip and then get your reaction to this. Two parts. So let's start with the micro. What's Tesla's financial situation right now? And as you said, they re actually increased cash by $3 billion, but only a billion of it or so was from cash flow from operations. The other $2 billion was incremental debt, non-recourse debt, but still debt. So that's why the cash balances rose. The way I think about any car company, and for the moment, we're going to treat Tesla like a car company, because for the moment, in terms of recession risk, that's what it is. Um, Car companies have to fund their CapEx and have to fund operations even when demand goes down. And it's one of the most critical things about understanding about this industry is when demand declines, car companies start to burn cash very, very quickly. And in Tesla's case, they can't really afford to defer capital expenditures. They have to keep investing and growing the technology side of the business. So they're really in a bit of a tough spot because they have roughly $10 billion a year of CapEx. They can't not spend that money. And they have roughly $10 billion a year of general operating expenses. And again, they really can't defer any of those. They have to keep investing and growing. So that $26 billion in cash goes away pretty quickly if you start to see declines in demand from a recession. And we'll talk about competitive forces as well, but let's just talk about recession for the moment. Elon's very right to worry about car, a car company in a recession. And he does have PTSD from 08, absolutely. But that's a healthy perspective in this industry. So if demand declines and cash flow begins to go negative from operations, they have to continue to keep funding everything particularly the AV side of the business and all the other technology things they're doing. And so I think the wisest thing for Tesla to do right now, while the stock price is still extremely high, is to go out and do a $20 billion equity deal. It's only a 3% dilution to the value of the company. It's basically nothing. EPS numbers get cut only very, very small. So there's really not much risk doing it. And by adding another $20 billion, you bulletproof that balance sheet. And the number one thing you have to do as a car company to survive in the near term against any kind of exogenous shock is make sure you have all the cash you need. Look, it's the only reason Ford never went bankrupt because in 08, GM and Chrysler did. The Ford family was wise enough to tell the CEO, raise all the cash you can. And that's why Ford is still a public company, still controlled by the family, because they did that. And I think you know, Tesla can take a page out of that book and understand that you really have to be very, very conservative with cash and have as much as you possibly can, not just for the recession risk, but for the risk that the industry develops in an unhealthy way. And we can talk about that next. But as a point of reference, we want to have Tesla have as a bulletproof a balance sheet as absolutely possible. And raising $20 billion doesn't hurt the current equity holders hardly at all, but materially improves the liquidity of the company over the medium term. This is another topic, Jeff, that you've been telling us about, you know, the requirement to scale the manufacturing before it gets cost effective, the a focus on manufacturing costs. What's your reaction when you heard uh, what he was recommending? So the 10 and 10, uh, you know, makes sense in terms of, I mean, Tesla is somewhere between seven and 9 billion on CapEx. And remember a lot of this CapEx is for Dojo, but, but Nick's right. You know, Tesla needs to keep investing to grow gigafactories and to grow these option plays, you know, like Dojo and so forth, RoboTaxi, Bot and so forth. So, so that part of that um, makes sense. But this whole thing about, um, you know, having, you know, a recession in the 08 recession, you know, the, the drawdown in the U S auto market was roughly the peak, the trough was 36%. I think one year went down 16%. And then by the end of the second, year uh, and halfway through that second year, GM went bankrupt. I think that the max drawdown from 07 to 09 was 36%. EV as a percent of, of total auto is growing at around 40%. Not saying that that's going to hold, but you know, right now EV is a secular grower inside of the auto industry. So we could have the worst. Nobody's calling this, this recession the next year in terms of its magnitude to be anywhere near the great financial crisis in 08. But, you know, I think Tesla would be in a better position than others 
But in terms of this comment regarding, you know, having negative cash flow, I mean, that's a real possibility. I know Elon, it's not something Elon wanted uh, to do, but we're getting, we're under, you know, right around a billion or so uh, after all the investments again. And so that, is that possible? Maybe, but I mean, we're growing units this quarter. Hopefully Q1 is still strong, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a risk. So I get the call out. Tesla, I think, drew a seven billion dollar credit facility in january and a lot of people were asking i was it's either five or seven um we'll, we'll go back and check uh, but tesla pulled that out and uh i'm assuming it's it's live and i believe that's part of the uh the two billion they drew off of in this quarter and they added almost a billion in, in their operations of cash so i think they put themselves in a, in a very good position uh, and I think Tesla's, I think Tesla's going kind of part of the way in terms of what Nick is is saying. But in terms of like just going for twenty billion at one point, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right move or not. It's certainly an interesting conversation um, to have. But I think again, Tesla is not doing zero. I believe they did about a seven billion dollar credit facility that they've drawn two on. That's great to hear what your position is on this. Um, so the next one. Is we're going to talk about is whether or not China can go global, and I have to apologize to you <laughs> because you've been saying you've had doubts that China can go past China, um, you know their own their own country, and I'm like, no, oh. <laughs> you know I I get when you said that they're not going to be able to necessarily penetrate the U.S. because of uh, taxes, incentives, and they need to build a factory. Although they're building apparently three Chinese auto companies are building factories in Mexico. But I never believed you. <laughs> now we've got Nick Cola saying that he believes China is not going to be able to go. China automakers won't be able to go global. So let's listen to him. Our picture is the Chinese companies have operated in China with you know a lot of mandates and a lot of support from the government, and the government sees it as a critical industry, which is absolutely correct. But again. The question is, do they all survive? You know, we can sort of draw a parallel to the world of the internet, uh, where you have two internets in the world. You have the China internet and then you have the, the Western internet. And I wonder if we're gonna have the same kind of dynamic when it comes to vehicles, particularly to electric vehicles. Are we gonna have sort of a Western dominated set of companies and then China lives in its own world? doesn't mm. allow as much competition as otherwise. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think the Chinese companies, bottom line, are, are viable competition. They're going to be low price competition eventually. And we talked about why that's so important. Uh, but they're really just one other player in the game. They, they don't really have, I think, the same level of assurance of long-term survivability as a Tesla does, for example. They're kind of right now, and the market agrees with this, they're kind of in the same bucket as a GM and a Ford, which have a lot of economies of scale, but don't have a big EV product product line yet. They're better on the EV product line in China, but the question is, can they scale globally? And that's a really important thing for the car industry. Most car companies are highly successful, Toyota being one example, have a global footprint. Ford has a global footprint, probably too global, but at least they do have a global footprint. And the question will be, as we transition to EVs, can you survive as a non-global car company because you don't have the economies of scale of being able to sell that many units? So Jeff, your background with managing global uh, business in, the, in your case, the mobile phone industry, how important is it to be global and what's your thinking about China? Yeah, so don't un don't underestimate the Chinese. That's, I mean, that's point one, but what I've been saying is gonna be difficult for them or, or two, to, two to three fundamental issues. One is the software piece of it and having a global software platform that they can put their hardware on top of, you know, that they had that with the ability to do that with, with Android, for example, in the smartphone world, and they were able to go global, you know, many companies, Xiaomi, Huawei, um, Oppo, Vivo, many of them were able to go global using an open source Android platform um, as kind of the software basis and which did a lot of the work for localization for every country in the world. So that's the key thing is, they don't have that. So how, how's BYD going to localize all the different language support, all the different reg regulatory, all that work that has to be done with each one of these governments? That's part of the work of going global. It's not just, you know, setting up the logistics lanes and getting product there, which they're capable of doing. They're setting up in South America now. They've been building, you know, doing final assembly on buses you know, in the U.S. for some period of time. It's not like they're, it's not like they're not capable, but 
The software piece of it, though, is going to be an issue for, for regular consumers and being able to localize software in each geography. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is going to be regulatory. There's going to be a lot of you're already hearing in the EU that, you know, they've got an investigation launched against um, Chinese national um, automakers that are, you know, importing into um, the EU without having a manufacturing presence in the EU and um, and a significant one. So that's under investigation. I think they're going to get a lot of heat. And I think the EU is going to want to protect, you know, their auto industry, the BMW, VW, uh, Porsche, um, Mercedes, and so forth. I think they're going to want to protect their auto industry. So you're going to have the regulatory piece of it as well. And then finally, I mean, this is an issue right now, but you know, Nick gets into a little bit about the build quality piece of it. And, and I think that's something that the, the Chinese will improve over time and figure it out. You know, the question is, is are they going to get something that's going to be, you know, a hit in multiple geographies, something, you know, like the Model Y or Tesla really cracked the code um, on that product. Not only is it the number one selling EV, it's the number one selling car everywhere. So, um, that's difficult for companies to do is to be able to crack that code, design one product and have it transcend globally. And the reason, you know, number one is, the, is, is that's really driving the Model Y is the, the brand, the Tesla brand is, you know, pioneer in EV and then the performance of the product and it, and it looks good. And I, doing those three things together at once is difficult. So software, regulatory, and really getting the product right globally I think are going to be a challenge for, for the Chinese. Maybe one may crack through. The other thing that's going to be weighing on top of them is, you know, volume and the ability. If you don't have that global scale, you're, it's going to be difficult for them to compete, um, you know, on a global footprint. So, for, you know, from a cost basis. So even it's surprising, but it's true, especially if they have to localize. If they have to localize in South America, you've got to knock the product down. You have to build it you know, in South America, same thing for the U S they'd have to build up from scratch. And so I'm not painting them all as, as highly manual and unautomated because that's not the case in China, but many of them are, and that highly manual process won't translate in the EU and it won't from a cost structure perspective and certainly won't in the U S as well. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com. Okay, but you got to answer this question for me then. Makes sense what you said, makes sense what Nick says, but what I don't understand is Toyota was able to go global in the 70s. Hyundai was able to go global in the 80s. You know, they were able to come and do this. Why would we think that, you know, China won't be able to do what they're doing? Yeah, and one one vendor may be able to break through, but we've got um, we've got trade agreements with Japan and Korea. So from a regulatory side, um, you know, that's been sorted out. And I, in this climate, I don't see it anywhere in the near future where their, where their auto industry is going to come in without heavy tariffs, you know, into the U S same thing. If we ship into China too, there's heavy tariffs on us. They want, you know, our manufacturing to be localized. The difference is if, if we localize in China at their labor rate and we're decently automated, you're going to do okay from a cost structure, especially if you build up your supply chain localized to your factory in China, which Tesla has. Tesla is 95% sourced around Shanghai for the Shanghai facility. That's going to be more difficult for them to get their cost structure right using U.S. labor and on a whole U.S. supply base. That's going to be very difficult for them to get, you know, their cost structure. Like they're, they're competing, either they're, they're competing on their cost structure and, and they're going to have one, maybe both hands tied behind their back. Okay. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, so let's get to the next topic, which is, which I thought was quite interesting. He tells us a little bit of how he views Tesla and how he values Tesla as a stock, as an investment. Let's watch him. So the way I think about Tesla, let's just sort of break it down. Tesla right now is worth around about $700 billion in terms of total market cap. That's the value of the company. And it's a big value, but it is, I think it's justifiable from a number of perspectives. The way I look at it is twofold. The first is what is the value of any car company on the planet that we are sure is gonna survive the transition to electric vehicles? And to my mind, there's only two, Tesla, obviously. And then the other one is Toyota. 
And it's not just me that thinks that. The market cap of Toyota is roughly $300 billion. It's the only other car company in the world that has a market cap consistently over $100 billion. That tells me that the market thinks Toyota will survive. And I happen to agree. I've toured Toyota plants. I know the operating model very well. They are the low-cost producer globally. So we have two car companies that will survive, Tesla and Toyota. Tesla's obviously got a much bigger valuation, 700 instead of 300. The incremental $400 billion very simply is the value of autonomous driving. It is recognizing that Tesla has made tremendous strides in autonomous vehicle technology and will continue to make more. And it's the assumption that there is some, what I would call call option value, not an equity value per se, but a call option value on Tesla becoming the premier provider or a premier provider of autonomous vehicle technology. Both of those numbers, rather though, that latter number is a bit squishy because obviously AV technology is worth a whole lot more than $400 billion when Tesla gets it up and running. But that's the way I bucket the Tesla valuation. And it comes down to the value of a survivor in the industry, which we know Tesla will be, and then this value of autonomous vehicle technology. And right now it's very volatile. You know, as you probably know, call options are much more volatile than stocks in terms of price. That's why Tesla is so volatile because in many ways that value of the call option moves around a lot every day, just based on the whims of the market. But that's the way I think about it. We have two buckets, the survivor buckets, which Tesla will be. And then we have the AV bucket where Tesla is clearly in the lead. And the combination of these two things makes for the market value of the company. Okay, so Jeffy has, there's two topics here. I want to get your feedback on both of them. Shockingly, he says Toyota is going to survive. And then secondly, he talks about how the way that he sees Tesla's um, price of, you know, $250 where we're at, about $700, trillion, $700 billion, is that its, its car company worth is about $300 billion, which is equivalent to Toyota. And then the $400 billion part of it, which is like two-thirds of it, is option play, he thinks, autonomous vehicles. So which one of those topics you want to address first, then we'll do the second one. Yeah, I mean, I have similar thoughts in terms of core business and option play, but I think the option plays are actually bigger. So you have, um, he calls AV or autonomous vehicles, but for Tesla, you can kind of split that in two buckets. You have FSD, which is FSD gets really good. V12, you know, comes out and it's deep, it's fully debugged and it's really, you know, it's really, you know, video in controls out. You have a very special situation where I, I think this is what people need to be mindful of is it doesn't necessarily mean Tesla has to announce a robo taxi network the next day. I think you're just going to get a very large uptake of FSD. You're going to have people just like, wow, this thing, I just, I, I, I put an address in, in my garage and it drives me out of my garage and, and, and sends me to whatever address I need to, to go to without touching anything. There's a, there's a significant value on that for consumers. So I think there's a pretty big slope in, um, in terms of the SaaS revenue with FSD alone uh, as, as that product gets better. And then of course you have the robo, ta robo taxi piece of it. So that's one option play. Then you've got the bot, you know, and then you've got energy, which is kind of right in front of us, um, but in growing, you know, 90% year over year, and that's going to continue uh, that stationary storage is going to continue to grow both at the consumer level and the, and at the, at the, um, you know, the non-consumer business level, that's going to continue to grow utility level. It's going to continue to grow. And then you can almost start thinking about, we don't have to, this could be a whole episode in itself, but is the auto, is the auto side of the business turning into an option play? And what I mean is, is the mass capitulation that's happening right now in the last week, you've had Ford, you've had GM, and you've even had VW announcements regarding, you know, cutting EV production, massive delays in, in, in cutting of EV investments. They already cut their supercharger investment early this year and said, you know, please, Tesla, you know, we'll gladly use your supercharger network. And then you know, a couple months later, literally just a couple months later, of course, they're in the middle of this VW, uh, UAW negotiation, sorry. And then they come out and say, we're delaying all these things for, you know, indeterminate periods of time. What happened in the last three to four months? They knew they were going into a negotiation with with the auto union. So what, what I'm thinking is, is this capitulation that's occurring, it's going to be a, a fairly big setback. And the question is, goes into, maybe we're going to, you know, we'll get into this in a bit is who survives and who doesn't. 
And where does that volume go? People are still going to need vehicles. Their, their current vehicles are going to, you know, are going to need to be, you know, replaced. And is Tesla going to be there now? You know, nobody really thought about it. They're, everybody thought of like just EV adoption growing and Tesla having a lot of market share, maybe not a majority, but kind of growing along with it. And now you have this capitulation occurring across many, many different OEMs have announced that. And some have even soft announced it, like Mercedes and Porsche have both announced it on the pricing side. So I even think the auto industry, auto side of it's actually turning into an option play on top of FSD, RoboTaxi, Bot, Energy, you know, Jojo. And, and even now the auto, the auto piece of it is now looking even more and more interesting, maybe above the 300 billion valuation. I love it. So that's the first you heard it here, guys. Auto industry could actually be an option play too. Um, and, and, you know, we've been talking about what could be catalyst for Tesla stock. And most people agree we need to see something to do with energy, with robots and, and uh, autonomous vehicle. But those are like may happen. But you've been saying that any, at, you know, moments like this, sometime this other car companies could, your word, capitulation, and that could jump the stock because people are going to start realizing investors realizing that this is a bigger market for Tesla wide open, left open, wide open. Very cool. Uh, auto industry could be an option play. What's your thinking about Toyota? So great debate. Uh, I, he's convinced a lot of people. I'm not yet sure I'm there. Uh, what's your position? Do you think Toyota could actually survive? Well, so Toyota's had some issues in terms of direction over the last couple of years. Now, Toyota, Toyota also does a tremendous amount of ad spend, uh, both with print media and on you know television, all kinds of media. So now there's articles coming out saying, well, they're the great, you know, it, it was a it was wizardry for them to kind of wait and see all this failure in EV, so then they can come in later and learn from everyone, and then come in with you know with a much greater product maybe a year or two later. Um, so. So number one, you can't discount Toyota in terms of their cost structure and their global footprint. You can't. They're they're everywhere they need to be from a distribution perspective, and they've got they've got a good cost structure. So I agree with Nick in terms of you know they're kind of like the tallest tent pole you know outside of Tesla is is Toyota. Now nothing's guaranteed. They're trying castings. They're trying to do different ba different battery technologies. Everything like every few years is announced as some kind of dramatic breakthrough, maybe they'll, maybe they'll, you know, they'll, they will have a breakthrough. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily discount them. I just can't draw a straight line from where they're at to be number two in EV uh, or even in the top three, but you can't discount their cost structure and their global, their global footprint. So that's why I would, I would keep them in the conversation, but I just really to kind of wrap up this, auto as an option play thing, just think about it for a minute. Ford, GM, VW, you've heard Porsche and BMW um, complain about, uh, Mercedes complain about pricing and hold pricing, their volumes tailed off in EV. And then you've got these Chinese players that are getting resistance now in the, in the EU, tons of resistance to ever come to the US. And the, they themselves, there's capitulation happening in the Chinese auto industry and they're battling Tesla on their home turf. And Tesla's got new new Model Ys coming out. They have the brand new Model 3 coming out. And it's going to be an interesting thing to watch. But you've got, can China go global? I think I think that's a, a no right now, but it's a, it's a big question mark. And you have the others capitulating. So the next 12 to 18 months are going to be very interesting in the auto industry. I'm really, really glad we had a chance for you to give your feedback on this. Uh, the Nick Colas interview was incredible. So I'm going to go and pin that Great. to this at the end of this show. You guys have to watch it if you haven't seen it yet. This guy has got incredible credibility. He's got 30 years of both investment banking, financial analyst, but also he's got 30 years of auto expert. And then listening to Jeff explain things <clears throat> uh, a little bit better is fantastic. So follow Jeff on X at the Jeff Lutz. Thank you again. Really appreciate this, Jeff. Sam. Yeah, great job with the interview, Herbert. It's really well done.